Hello, and welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we'll be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with Claire Richards. Claire's a singer and songwriter who shot to fame in 1997 as a member of the pop sensation Steps. The group inspired a fanatical following thanks to their catchy, era-defining hits and their accompanying dance moves. Claire's enjoyed a successful solo career since the group parted ways in 2001, and fans will be delighted to hear that the reunited Steps are set to release new music later in 2020. Claire lives with her husband and their two children. Due to the circumstances we all find ourselves in at the moment, I'm meeting with Claire via a video call. Claire Richards, welcome to the Marie Curie Couch. Thank you very much for having me. Can I ask you if you've had a significant death in your life? Um, Yes, I have. I think it was 16 years ago. My auntie, she was diagnosed with lung cancer in the January of 2004. And... They, at diagnosis, they gave her three months and somehow, bless her, she made it, I think it was 10 months in the end, she died in the October of that year. It was a very short illness really in the grand scheme of things, but by the time she was diagnosed, it was really too late for them to do anything. She did have chemotherapy and had to have regular transfusions and stuff, so I think it just took its toll rather quickly on her but thankfully for us longer than was initially thought. You had a bit more time together. Yeah absolutely. So can I just take you back to when your auntie was first diagnosed how did you find out about it? Who told you? Well it was my parents. We'd known she'd been ill and she'd been to the hospital a couple of times and she was told she had pneumonia before Christmas the year before but she she wasn't getting any better so she kept going back and then she was diagnosed and it was kind of at the time we are quite a big family and we were we were really close so everybody kind of went to the hospital and by the time I got there everybody had been told but I hadn't and (laughs) I've got a bit of a reputation in my family for sticking my head in the sand a little bit and not really liking to face anything so I think everyone was a little bit frightened to to tell me what was going on and um at this point we were kind of all in a waiting room at the end of the corridor and my mum and dad kind of I remember it so clearly my mum one side and my dad the other I've started already (laughs) kind of linked arms and they they had to hold me up I suppose I definitely would have avoided situations like that like it was all a bit kind of, you know, how's Claire going to react? How's, how's she going to deal with it? And once I was in the room, I was fine. I made some kind of stupid joke, which did make her laugh, which I'm, <laughs> I'm glad it made her laugh and not cry. But then, you know. And I can see it's still painful for you now. I don't think about those moments often, but when you record, I don't know, instantly those kind of feelings and those thoughts come back. My granddad had passed away before that. My mum's dad. and this auntie was my mum's sister so there had been quite a lot of cancer and on that side of the family but with my aunt it was she was my mum's younger sister they were one of six so my auntie was the youngest then it's my mum then my other two aunties and then two uncles I was only eight when my granddad died so it it was awful because my mum was devastated but with auntie Pauline I think it had a massive impact on on us as a family and and me, I suppose. We definitely grew up a little bit that year. I think there's that thing, isn't there, about when you're younger as well, if there's a close connection between aunties 
then the cousins are going to be together and you'll be spending more time together and that person still like a parental figure isn't it it's still somebody who can be very close absolutely and she was always if there was anything ever wrong with any of us kids or my, even my mum she was always the first one there always she would have done anything for anybody she was also she was a bit of a whirlwind her favorite phrase was i'm not stopping she'd fly in have a cup of coffee and then be off again so she was always on the move doing something i always remember she was, i'm not stopping i'm not stopping and then you know an hour and a half later she was still there <laughs> most of the time a great ball of energy yeah she really was you knew when she was there for sure i mean they're all quite big personalities my mom and her sisters anyway but she was um yeah she was definitely something <laughs> so going back to that time claire so yeah. you're in the hospital you've just had the very shocking news broken to you by your mum and dad they're on either side of you you stay at the hospital for the kind of remainder of the day i know that you spoke there about um other people in the family having died before your aunt and there being um cancer in the family so that was something that you know it wasn't wasn't the first time people had talked about cancer how about death and dying as a family do you remember when you were kind of younger was that talked about as a family openly or um i don't really know i don't remember because my grandma died so my dad's mum she died when i was five or six i think and then my grandfather was a bit later on, so before my auntie as well. So I'd had three grandparents had passed away before my auntie. And after my auntie, unfortunately, one of my mom's brothers passed away as well from cancer. But we weren't as close to him. So even though it was shocking, and again, really a short illness, and it was only a couple of years after Auntie Pauline. So, but at growing up, I don't really, I know people had died and, and, I, and I know they weren't there anymore, but I hadn't, I don't remember it ever really be some, something that we discussed that much. Maybe it's because I was too young or I don't know. It, it's a weird one, I, but I was aware that it happened. I mean, I didn't go to funerals and stuff because my mum and dad always felt we were too young to go to grandparents' funerals. And they, I guess they didn't want us to be around the sadness, if you like. Um, I did go to my dad's dad's funeral, actually. I remember because I wore my school uniform because I was probably about 14 or 15. <laughs> it was my smartest outfit, it must have been at the time. It's interesting, the conversations that certainly I've had with people at work, you know, as a social worker in palliative and end of life care um, about whether or not children should go to funerals mm. and whether they should be included in those rituals. And I think like you, when I was small, small, younger, I can't really remember anybody that significant dying when I was very young. But I think if they had, I'd, I don't know whether I would have been allowed to go to the funeral yeah and I think I mean as a parent now myself I don't know I think anybody significant in our life that maybe did pass now they're at an age where they're 10 and 13 I don't think I would want to rob them of that experience to say goodbye um but if they were any younger I'm not sure they really would would have understood or would understand and my uncle died a couple of years ago who I was really close to growing up and for a period of time my kids were as well because they him and my auntie looked after him they're not blood auntie and uncle they we called them my mum's best friend but I didn't take them to that and I didn't two years ago my nan passed as well my my la my mum's mum last grandparent they weren't very close to her and I just not so much me because they've seen me cry but I don't know how I would have dealt with them seeing my mum upset for example I think I'm not sure, and maybe I'm taking a little bit of credit away from them in them not being able to deal with stuff like that. And I suppose it does make them tougher, but I can't bear seeing them upset. So maybe it's, maybe it is a selfish thing, but certainly, you know, if it was to be either of my husband's parents or my mum and dad, I would definitely not want them to, to not experience, you know, that ritual of saying goodbye and, and being able to, and, and knowing, I suppose that's, it should be the moment when you know that, or when you can really start to grieve properly, rather than just be upset a lot all the time. I remember before Auntie Pauline's funeral, it was, I just couldn't pull myself out of it, I suppose. The last 10 months of going through this with her and, and when she finally decided to, and I do, 
utterly believe that she decided it was her time. She, she stayed at home the whole way through. Um, but then I, on the Monday night, it was the, she died on the 12th of October and on the 11th of October, she said um, she wanted to go to the hospice and we all expected her to be there for, I don't know. I, I didn't know, didn't realize it was the end. I suppose, again, it was me sticking my head in the sand and by nine o'clock Tuesday morning, she was gone. So she, I hundred percent believe that she, that she knew exactly when she wanted to go and she knew it was time and, and she completely made that decision and it was all on her terms, so. But how nice, the thought of being able to have some control over your ending, you know, and, and whether or not we do know about it and we know when it's coming or how lovely to have that control over that. During that time, from when your aunt was diagnosed up until the October when she died, did she talk about um, her wishes? Or that, did she talk about the fact that she wanted to be in a hospice at the end? Did she know about hospices? Did she plan it? I think she must have done. A lot of those details she didn't really discuss with us because even though we were adults, she still referred to us as the babies, if you like. Yeah, of course. Because my sister was a hairdresser and she was the one that cut all her hair. And she was more upset about my sister having to be the one to do it than actually having it all cut off, which I found that quite tough to deal with. I thought that was, I thought she'd be more upset about it. And I was there as well. I kind of held her hand while my sister did it. And it was in the hospital and she was having treatment. And if we had to wash her or anything, she was m more upset and mortified about those things about than the fact that it was having to be done. That She was more upset that it was us doing it because she, she always felt that we should never, we were, the, we were the, so kids don't do that. Even though we weren't children, we were grown adults. Do you think that's what it was? Do you think that's what was so upsetting? Because it was like the children shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, definitely for her. A hundred percent. She d she said that when my sister was cutting her hair. I remember, I think it was maybe one day we were giving her a shower. There was one of those kind of sit down showers and then we were washing her and she broke down and she just, she was so, just so upset that we were doing it. I think if it had been my mum or my nan or any or one of my other aunties, I don't think she would have been up so upset, but because it was her nieces, or her daughter, she just, she just, yeah, she, she couldn't handle it. I don't know, but the, the image I'm getting is um, her being, you know, th through those actions, through having her two young nieces, one cutting her hair, one holding her hand, sounds, it sounds very supportive and very beautiful, Claire. Mm. And um, I was just thinking, um, but I imagine for her, that was probably a real, stare in the face of the reality of of what was happening so that's why it was also so painful as well that realization yeah I think so I think she was always such a strong character she was you know she always gave the impression that she was just kind of this whirlwind if you like that didn't need anybody and or need anything but she obviously did she adored her kids and she adored all of us and and to be that helpless I suppose was just not anything that she'd ever experienced before she she would never rely on anybody for anything she always wanted to do it herself and I think all of us have got a bit bit of that I think that's a family trait anyway but yeah for her to be in a position where she couldn't do those things for herself it just it was a bit of a shock for her and for all of us I suppose and it's so interesting that you say that because actually it's a, a common experience that lots of people, especially those who've been so incredibly independent, but, but you know, an experience that lots of people would face when they're losing so much of themselves and their ability to do things. And actually it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, seeing her so upset and crying, maybe they were tears of frustration frustrated at the situation, frustrated that the nieces had to do that. But then it's interesting how we perceive them and we experience them as sadness, where actually there might have been something else in that. Yeah, you're probably right, actually. I think if I put myself in her position, I probably 
it, it would be fr frustration uh, and even anger, I suppose, <laughs> that that something like that was happening and that had happened so quickly and there was really nothing anybody could do about it. You know, the chemotherapy that she had was just to give her a bit more time. And as much as we all appreciate that time, and it's events like this that have happened throughout my life that make me believe that everything happens for a reason. That year that she was ill, I should have been doing a solo album and, and for whatever reason, it, it, it didn't happen. So I was there, I was around, I was there every single day that I needed to be there. So when I look back, just before it happened, I thought, oh God, why is this happening to me? And then once we got the news about her, I knew exactly why. I'm very close to my cousin, who's her daughter. We're closer in age than, than some of them. And my sister, we would, the three of us would take her for lunch at least once or twice a week. We'd go somewhere different. And it, for that whole period of time, we'd never done it before, really. Maybe once in a blue moon. But for that whole period of time, we did it at least once a week. She never really ate much, but just having that and having that time I never would have had it if it, if it happened a year before or two years before I wouldn't have been there so I'm grateful every day for for that time that that I did have and I know that everything happens for a reason one way or another and at some point we find out what that reason is absolutely and I think that you were then given this time so you could do all of that together it was like a gift <laughs> So you said that your aunt went into the hospice on the day before she died. Yeah. I know this wasn't discussed with you, but why do you think hospice care was important to her? I don't think she wanted to die at home. I don't think right. she wanted to, to leave that memory of her for everybody, especially for my cousin um, and for my uncle, I suppose. I think for her, it just would have tarnished the family home and made it more difficult for them I know she would have been thinking about how it would have been for everybody else rather than for her I think we all would like to think we die peacefully in our in the surroundings that we we want to but I'm pretty sure that her final decision would have been made on the basis that it, it was better for for her memory and for for everyone else not having to go back to that house and and see where she died or think about the room where she passed away. I think I'm pretty sure that's why. Were any of the family able to be with her at the hospice? Yeah, my mum was actually there. Um, my uncle, her husband, and I can't remember where I was that morning. I, it was a surprise to hear that she had gone so early. But my cousin, she was she waited for my cousin to get there. She... um. I think my mum was there for maybe an hour before and she wouldn't let go until my cousin got there and she did. And then that was it. So she was there with her mum? Yeah. We all said our goodbyes the night before. I think I, in my head, I, all the way along, even though I knew that she wasn't going to get better, all the way along I thought at some point there would be some kind of miraculous recovery I suppose, and I've, I, I never really think of myself as an optimistic person. I don't know, it's just me trying to shove out what was actually going to happen and not having to face it. I saw her afterwards as well. We went to the hospice and it was something I never thought I'd do. I really never thought I would ever want to see somebody after they'd passed. I kind of had no interest, but we did. We went and I said goodbye and give her a kiss on the cheek and... She just looked like she was sleeping. It's so weird. Was that a nice thing to do? Are you glad you did that? Yeah, I am glad I did it, actually. I never thought that I would have, but I am. I'm glad because she looked peaceful. Finally. Sorry. Don't be sorry at all. I mean, you know, having this conversation again, as you said, they're not conversations we go back to all the time. No. They're not conversations we have very often. And so when we do, you know, this was somebody who was hugely significant in your life and someone you were incredibly sad about losing. So what you're experiencing now and by having a bit of a cry is the most normal thing in the world. <laughs> oh, dear. Can I ask, um, had your aunt planned her funeral? Um, I think the elements of it, yeah, she had. There were songs that she wanted played. Um, 
we, we're not a particularly religious family, so we had a humanist ceremony, which was nice because it just celebrated her and talked about her. Um, but yeah, she'd always said all along certain songs that she wanted, and she did have a wicked sense of humour. And we all thought that she was joking to a certain degree, but she kept saying that she wanted the song Take My Breath Away by Berlin. And that is the song that was playing when we walked into the crematorium. So, <laughs> but she, you know, she meant it. And, and she got it. Yeah, she got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she did get, she didn't want to have any flowers. She was adamant. One of the last things she said to me was, like, I don't want any lilies. And, and she said the F word as well. <laughs> she did have a bit of a, she liked to swear, bless her. But she said, don't, don't want any flowers and she went and don't get me any lilies but she hated the smell of them she could not stand the smell of lilies and and I don't remember ever really thinking about it before but I can't either anymore if I get lilies in a bouquet I have to take them out because I remember that as being one of the last things she said to me and every time I smell a lily I think oh I can't stand that Every day and night, Marie Curie nurses and frontline staff give vital support to dying people and their families. We rely on the generosity of the public to deliver our care, but due to the coronavirus pandemic, our fundraising activities are grinding to a halt. We urgently need you to donate today. Visit mariecurie.org.uk forward slash donate. What was the experience like after she died? I can see it's still painful and with you now but do you remember what it was like those first few months and weeks afterwards um yeah it was just my marriage was breaking down at the same time anyway or or I don't know whether that had something to do with it because he just didn't understand the grief I suppose I was going through it was definitely a massive um I'd only been married the year before so I got married in 2003 and I do remember just not really being able to pull myself out of it for a long time. I cried a lot. And I always feel like it, everything changed after she passed because we were and not so much a big family anymore because we're just not. And I don't know if it's because we're all much older now and we've people have moved away and had their own kids and we've all got our own lives, professional or personal it really felt like, to me, it felt like it changed after she died. It just wasn't the same. You know, whether she was the glue that held everything together, I'm not sure. But that's how it felt a bit to me. A real pivotal moment. Yeah, I, I, I definitely feel that. It, it's really weird. I don't know if it's because everybody was in their own kind of bit of shock or and was grieving in their own kind of way, but it just... After that, my cousin moved away. She moved to the Midlands. So don't really, even now, I don't really see her as often as we used to. And we, everybody just kind of drifted apart a little bit. It's a bit weird, but it, that's how it felt to me. Or maybe I just withdrew. I don't know. <laughs> well, it sounds like you had two very significant things going on there. Mm-hmm. You know, not only losing your land to was an incredibly important person to you, but also the ending of a marriage. And they're tough things to deal with. So it was certainly a pivotal time in your life for you. Mm-hmm. But also that loss um, in, in, in lots of families and relationships, um, it, it does change everything. Mm. and and nothing is really ever the same again but um you know i suppose that process of grief is working towards finding the new world where that person's just not physically in it anymore yeah i think so because for my mom and my one of my other aunties especially they they were always so close and always had spent so much time together also my parents had broken up a couple of years before so it was there was this period of maybe about three or four years where everything and I felt I I really do feel like up until that point I'd had pretty nice life up until then I I counted myself pretty lucky that even though we'd lost people I was either too young or it wasn't really anybody too close and nothing really that bad had happened I'd been really lucky with my career and even though we'd been over 
I've been through a few bumps with that as well. My personal life, especially, I'd always felt up until that point that it was just, it was great and I hadn't had any problems. But then all of a sudden, it's like the world exploded. And one after the other, all the, it's like a, like a domino effect, if you like, of just all this stuff going bang, 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 and, and not, not really dealing with each thing when it happened. And until Auntie Pauline, I suppose, when we had no choice but just to concentrate on, on her and, and that, that period of time. So I'm glad that period is over. I bet you are. It's definitely made me stronger, though. I feel like I'm, I am quite an emotional person and I'm not very good with dealing th- with things head on, but it has made me stronger. And I, rather than let people walk all over me now, which is something I used to do, I, I now know how to say no. It's definitely made me realise that, and even this situation that we're going through now, everything that we have is so precious and our lives are so precious. And one minute it's there and the next minute without knowing it, it, it could be gone, whatever that may be. And whoever that may be, you don't, we, I think we all just breeze through life thinking, you know, everything's going to be perfect forever or everything's going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. My kids are going to be okay. You never really want to think about the bad stuff, which is, which is right in a way. But I definitely feel more prepared for those things when they come at me now. You mentioned a, a little bit before um, about your, your career changes and and you know there was some some very public losses there wasn't there for you you know with regards to with regards to your career um am i right claire in thinking that was before or around the time your aunt died it sounds like there was so much going on you were saying you couldn't handle each bit and i'm thinking no wonder you can't handle each bit because you didn't have any time to because there was so much happening well, it was, I th- it was the end of 2001 that I left the group. And then 2002 was the year that I, I did an album with H. And that ended pretty badly because I, I had all these expectations of what it was going to be and what was going to happen. And we had a couple of hit singles, but coming off the back of riding so high with Steps and with the band, everybody expected us to be... Or, or to have a massive hit and it just wasn't so I, I didn't take that very well at all so from at the end of 2002 I decided that that was it I'm not I'm not doing it anymore I w- didn't want to put myself in a position where I would be judged by anybody and then obviously I got married and 2004 was Auntie Pauline and and then the marriage ending and then and then I just kind of went into this I don't know what it was really. I just, I hid myself away for a very long time. It was a good 10 years. Yeah, it was 2011 really was the next time I did anything to do with what I started my career doing, which was singing. And I'd done silly little things up before that, but mostly TV stuff. So I'd I'd gained a hell of a lot of weight, which is, you know, everybody knows about. But it was all after that initial couple of years with Auntie Pauline dying and the divorce. And so I spent a lot of, years in the wilderness if you like just I don't know if it was me trying to discover who I was because I didn't really know I was 19 when I got into the band so I I was a kid and I wasn't a very worldly wise kid either I kind of grew up I still lived with my parents and you know I hadn't really gone out there and experienced the world and then all of a sudden we were traveling the world and selling out arenas and for four years we had this amazing career and everything was perfect. And, and then it was gone like that. And yeah, I was in the wilderness for a, a long time. No, I was just thinking that timing thing you mentioned, actually, you know, what it sounds very clear to me, like there was a need for healing mm. after all those significant losses, the career, the band, the hopes and dreams of the next album, your aunt, marriage, meh, huge things, Claire. And so I think, you know, to, to need a period of time after that, yeah, make, makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I, I don't think I realised it's what I needed, but it was because I look at myself now and maybe a bit too much, but I, I try and be in control of as much as possible 
you know, if back in the day with the group, especially, we didn't have a clue what was going on behind the scenes. We just let everybody do it for us. We went out on stage and did our thing. And then we didn't think about any of that stuff. But now I, it has put everything into perspective for me. I know it's, it is my job. I love my job, but it's, I have my own children now. I have a husband, a home, you know, I have a mortgage. It's, it's not about me going out there having fun anymore. It's, it's a job and it's a business. And if I'm not paying attention to it, then nobody else is going to. So those years, they definitely made me realize what I didn't want anymore. Maybe not so much what I did want, because sometimes I don't know that until it comes along. But it definitely made me realize what I didn't want to be and what I didn't want to do anymore. And thought, do you know what? I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So I may as well give some of this stuff a go, <laughs> even if it is scary. And also, as you're describing now, you've got different responsibilities in your life. I think all of those life events you will have learned from and then be facing what's to come now in a different way because you're a different woman. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I don't want to say I've finally grown up, but I've definitely got a clearer attitude towards stuff. I mean, I'm the most indecisive person you'll ever meet. And if someone else can make a decision for me, then that's fine by me. But there are times when I feel like I have to take control of a situation because nobody else is. So I, I do. And sometimes, it's quite satisfying sometimes to know that I've got the ability to be that strong. And I, when I think back to that day in the hospital when everybody was expecting me just to fall apart, I've definitely come a long, long way. I know that I've changed and I know that that is one of the most significant events to have happened that did change me 100%. And my outlook on life and how we deal with each situation that is thrown at us. I, I do believe everything happens for a reason and it is only because of that year and because of her illness and just how I ended up being there because any other year I just wouldn't have been. Just going back to you are very open and very honest, and I'm so grateful, Claire, um, our conversation about death and dying. Can I ask, do you ever think about your own death? Um, yeah, sometimes I find that I do. And I have to be honest, it terrifies the life out of me. Probably mostly because of my kids, because I would hate to miss out on one single second of anything that they go through or they achieve or I just that's that is what scares me more than anything about dying is missing out on a single second of their lives <laughs> I'm gonna annoy the hell out of them their whole lives I'm sure but that's yeah that's what I think about when I think about death is God couldn't imagine not being here when they get married or when they leave school or it sounds silly and it's quite a morbid thought but if like yeah sometimes I do think about that and I don't think it's a morbid thought. And I think what you're describing is incredibly, you know, natural and normal. And for those people who, like your aunt, are faced with the terminal illness and their parents, then they've got to begin to think about all of those things, you know. Um, so, so you think about it sometimes. Do you talk about it ever? So have you, have you made any plans for the future? So there's some very practical things like people, you know, will make a will. Yeah. Um, or some people will go as far, regardless of their age um, or health, will go as far as um, planning a funeral. Um, I must admit, I haven't thought that far because, again as much as I do think about it sometimes in my head, you know, it's never going to happen to me. I'm going to be immortal, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we did make a will when we had our eldest, but we haven't changed it since our daughter was born, which is 10 years. So we, uh, that is something that I do need to do because it's one of those jobs that you, and it, I've thought about it more recently because of what's going on as well. I think I would hate to leave everything in a mess as well. I do, you know, yeah, it's really, it's a really important one. It's very practical, but it's a very important one. You know, often we, we know from the families we've supported where there hasn't been a will or the will hasn't been updated. Yeah. It makes it a bit more complicated at the end. And actually, it's a time when you're grieving, you 
don't want any more complications and you don't want to you don't you don't want to have to deal with anything else but you know again lots of people in your situation as well and loads and loads of people haven't got wills um and i think his parents as well and even in these times of covid you know people are still getting wills and it is still possible so you might uh you might you might be left after this call today thinking about that and going having a chat with a hubby I know, I know we have to do it. I, every few months we go, we've got to do that. We have to do that. And then we still just don't. It's so silly. It's so silly. And I'm way too much of a control freak to not have everything <laughs> written down exactly. This is how it's going to be. This is what I want. This is where this is going. And this is who's going to look after my kids. And yeah, I would be absolutely devastated, even though I obviously wouldn't be here, but I would be devastated to think that I'd left anything in any kind of mess for someone else to have to sort out it's not it's not fair regardless of anything else yeah yeah um is legacy something that's important to you what would your legacy be oh i don't know actually i think um i think i would like to be remembered as someone that was kind not even so much anything about the work i think it's more important for me that I was a nice person and I did nice things and I was I was kind and I was a good mum. I would just like to be remembered fondly, I think. Well, listen, Claire Richards, thank you so much for joining me today on the Marie Curie Couch. It's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. Great conversation. And I'll remember you as a wonderful woman. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 090 2309 or search Marie Curie online. This podcast is made by Marie Curie, a national charity that supports people affected by terminal illness. For more information and support, you can visit our website mariecurie.org.uk. The podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Sound and Vision. The music featured is Time Lapse by Panoceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye.